The next one coming to hypoglycemia. Uh, when I talk about hypoglycemia, uh, hypoglycemia can be because of uh, different me medicines as well. It can be because of sulfonylureas or uh, can be because of uh, certain medications like pioglitazole or then SGLT2 uh, inhibitors and insulin as well. So as medical practitioners, I think most of them will be knowing how to manage uh, or how to change those prescriptions. So that is one cause. And the other causes when it comes to diet is uh, fasting, skipping meals and inadequate carbohydrate intake uh, or sudden burst of physical activity. So when it comes to diet, how is that we're going to uh, make the changes? So first thing is fasting and feasting is no to a diabetic patient, uh, which is like a very common um, slogan that we keep saying. Skipping meals, if you're going to skip meals, uh, because of having a short fast, then make sure that they go to, uh, they come back to the diabetologist and, and they change the you know, medications accordingly. Sometimes going on a very low carbohydrate diet also leads to hypoglycemia. So when uh, having an inadequate carbohydrate in the diet, not just leads to hypoglycemia, but also leads to tiredness and fatigue, which has to be adjusted. And the uh, next one in the 15-15 rule, with, uh, here most of them say that, you know, carbohydrate counting can be done even for uh, type 2 diabetes, but that is something that I won't really, uh, you know, advocate because uh, especially who are not, uh, who are on, you know, basal doses of insulin, uh, it doesn't really work with type 2 diabetes because there is some amount of uh, insulin that has been created by the body as well. Whereas in type 1 diabetes, it is only uh, the sole insulin production is from the uh, insulin that uh, injections that they take so at that point of time the 15 15 rule really applies there so here i have a small case where uh, uh, we had a 60 year old female uh, with 20 years of history of diabetes there, where she went on a very low carbohydrate diet and her uh, uh, post lunch in uh, glycemic levels dropped below 60 mg so uh, this is just to show, uh, show you know, uh, she was on a very low carbohydrate diet without adjustments in insulin. So that led uh, uh, led to, you know, serious complications of her having uh, sweating, jitteriness and pal um, palpitations. So their insulin management, dietary modification and glycemic awareness was very important. So these are certain places where we can help, you know, as uh, diabetic educators or nutritionists can uh, help in modifying the meal plan accordingly. And another common uh, issue with them would be polyphagia, excessive hunger. The excessive hunger, uh, the common nutrient guideline that is given is have small frequent meal that really does not help with polyphagia. Why? Because glucose is present in the body. Glucose is present in the bloodstream, but it is not utilized by the cells is what causes polyphagia. So unless and until they don't bring their sugar levels into control, their polyphagia is going to go nowhere. So just pushing the patient to have you know, a small frequent meal will only cause them to have higher amount of calories and add to the metabolic bulk. Other GI symptoms like gastroparesis, reflex, constipation, fecal inconsistency, and flatulence are certain common GI symptoms that has been encountered by most of the diabetic patients. So here, the common uh, strategies that we have to keep in mind is first one is portion control. So when I talk about portion control, using measuring cups, using the exact amount to show them how much of portion has to be included in the diet becomes very, very important. And then chewing, asking them to chew food is very important when it comes to reflex diseases and flatulence fiber content excess of fiber also causes flatulence and certain times only having insoluble fiber in very high amounts also causes constipation so uh, we have to keep everything in moderation is what is important excess of fatty foods can also lead to reflex and gastro it increases the uh, risk of a patient going into gastroparesis and also when we talk about certain supplements certain supplements have concoctions or herbal extracts um, which might the the patient which the patient might take without you know uh, getting re referred from an Ayush practitioner. So that shouldn't be the case. Every time a herbal supplement is taken, a practitioner should be there to you know monitor how much amount of supplement is going inside and whether he or she can take that particular supplement or not. And when I talk the uh, when I talk about hy fasting hypoglycemia, which is very common in people who skip or have prolonged fasting intervals, especially people who do IF uh, in in. 
uh, I, IF uh, who have diabetes and also uh, who, you know, fast, especially in the early mornings. For them, just adjusting the medication and then midnight meals, especially if you are going to follow an intermittent fasting profile, having a good uh, midnight snack before starting the fasting window is very important. And an early morning snack or breakfast for people who are not on IF becomes important, especially housewives who, you know, do not have anything before they can um, start their day. They, they might, you know, be very busy with cooking but have nothing and eat breakfast only around 11 or 12 o'clock will definitely have fasting hypoglycemia. So these are some uh, things we can actually alter. The second, next one will be reactive hypoglycemia. Reactive hypoglycemia usually occurs after meal uh, where there is an in uh, insulin surge and that causes excess uh, glucose uptake. So uh, this is a classic example where we had a 45 year old male uh, with a five year history on a very high carbohydrate meal who felt very uncomfortable after one hour post meal and was not on any diabetic medication. Uh, his blood glucose showed 65 to 70. So logically after having a meal, uh, there should be an increase in the uh, uh, you know, glycemic, uh, glycemic levels around 120, 140, somewhere like that. But there, there will be a hypoglycemia. That is because, you know, there is a sudden surge of insulin to push all that glucose into the cell. So after all the glucose is pushed inside the cell, especially somewhere around 30 or 1 hour, you will you will have an extremely sudden drop in the, uh, uh, you will have an extremely sudden drop in the blood glucose level. So this will actually cause a, hypoglycemic condition which is known as reactive hypoglycemia so when i compare the first and the second case the first case was on a low carbohydrate diet and that's why i was able to tell them it was common hy hypoglycemia but here he was on a larger carbohydrate meal diet after which he had a hypoglycemic episode so that is how we can uh, you know differentiate between a reactive hypoglycemia and how the diet can be modified for both of them Next one is the fasting hypoglycemia. So fasting hypoglycemia is a very common condition uh, where we have two different phenomena involved, which is the dawn and the smoggy effect. Here uh, we'll have, uh, you know, a 3 a.m. Uh, hypos. So whenever a person is having an increased hyper, uh, extremely increased blood glucose level in the morning, we usually ask them to check the blood glucose uh, in between somewhere around 2 to 3 a.m. in the morning so that uh, they don't end up in having hypos in the midnight. So how is that we can uh, reduce this incidence is basically giving them a midnight snack or early morning. Again, the same principle applies early morning. Initially having a good amount of uh, protein rich snack is important so that you're not pushing in more of carbohydrates into the body. Now, when I talk about diabetic ketoacidosis and uh, HN, uh, uh, hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state, it is basically the difference between both of them is that in DKA occurs in type 1 and HHS uh, occurs in type 2, which is because of relative insulin deficiency. So here I have like, uh, I'm just uh, lacking time. So I'm, I'm just, you know, uh, moving a bit fast with these slides. So here we have uh, an increase in counter-regulatory hormone leading to hyperglycemia as well as uh, uh, hypoglycemia that causes loss of uh, water and electrolytes. So because of that, uh, there is increase in the blood concentration causing a hyperosmolaric state uh, leading to HHS. So what will be the uh, uh, treatment guidelines? This is mostly, uh, you know, you can't I would really say that when a person is ending up with HHS, their blood glucose will go around somewhere around more than 250 or 300. So immediately they have to go and visit a primary care practitioner and they have to get their you know IV fluids or their uh, uh, basic insulin regulated. So here we have a comprehensive guideline where they say that when serum glucose reaches around 200 in DK or 300 in HHS, 5% uh, dextrose has to be changed to around 0.4%. And you also have to check for certain parameters, especially BUN, pH, creatinine, and glucose. We usually check it for around 2 to 4 hours every time when a person end up having HHS. And uh, certain parameters that has to be uh, that have to be you know monitored are potassium and bicarbonate. Also, the pH of the blood has to always be uh, kept under normal. And whenever there is insulin being taken by the patient, insulin has to be regulated based on the uh, 